Hello wonderful person, this is Anton, and today we're going to be discussing a pretty exciting new discovery coming from our own solar system. A discovery from something that existed in the solar system approximately 4.5 billion years ago. And that discovery is also apparent in the rings of Saturn that you see right here. It seems that the early solar system, when it was still forming planets and when it used to have the protoplanetary disk, contained a major gap just like the rings of Saturn you see right here. But this finding has a lot of other implications other than just being a gap itself. It actually solves a major mystery. So let's talk a little bit more about this, including why these gaps form, and also what these gaps usually produce. But let's start right here. This is a really famous image of a star system known as GW Orionis. We've discussed this star system in one of the previous videos that's going to be popping up somewhere right there at some point. GW Orionis, or GW Ori for short, is extremely intriguing for various reasons. One of the major reasons is actually because of the amount of dust rings it contains on the inside and their overall inclination to one another. I know the typical protoplanetary disk contains something similar to this, and it usually just has a single disk in a similar plane of orbit. GW Ori contains three disks with three separate orbits. And as a result, it's probably going to have three extremely different types of planets once they end up forming. But the thing is, pretty much most of the protoplanetary disks that have been studied so far normally contain quite a lot of gaps on the inside. Gaps reminiscent to what we also observe in the rings of Saturn. Now we know that for Saturn, for example, and for a lot of other objects that contain large gaps, that's usually because they have planets forming or small moons forming that sort of end up absorbing a lot of the matter and leaving gaps behind, which is by the way one of the ways for us to find potential planets in other young planetary systems. But even though a lot of these objects contain gaps, not all of them are produced by planets. Currently some of these gaps are actually kind of difficult to explain. In other words, not every gap here is going to have a planet there, some of them are going to be entirely empty. And we've discussed something similar with the GW Ori system, where the scientists proposed that some of these gaps can actually be formed by the interaction between partner stars. In other words, some of this can also be formed through various gravitational interactions. On the other hand, if we go back to the solar system, and if we start looking around and looking for different objects and different, I guess, differences in those objects, we'll discover some unusual peculiar properties. So one very common question slash very common property becomes obvious in this image right here. There's an unusual divide between the types of objects that we have in the solar system. We have the terrestrial planets, although in this case this also includes our moon. Then we have these giant planets, which are also known as gas giants. And then we have everything else, including dwarf planets and including moons of gas giants. And here the common question is, well, why does this divide exist? Why is it that we have terrestrial planets and gas giants. Because this doesn't exist in all of the star systems we've seen so far, and in some star systems entirely different planets also occupy their own category that doesn't exist in the solar system. And then there's another mystery. The mystery of various meteorites and various asteroids we've been discovering across the solar system. This mystery has a name. It's known as the isotopic dichotomy. The most recent paper about this particular topic is in the description below. So, isotopic dichotomy refers to the unusual parameters inside the asteroids and inside meteorites that suggest that various asteroids seem to have one of two isotope combinations. And almost all of the meteorites we've discovered so far will either have one type of isotopes in them or will have a completely other type. It's very, very rarely that we found a meteorite that has both. So there's basically like this grouping, either you'll have these types of isotopes or you'll have other types. And this dichotomy becomes even more apparent when looking at two separate types of asteroids, with one of the types known as carbonaceous chondrite and the other one known as the non-carbonaceous chondrite. They're also sometimes known as CC and NC for short. And so this NC-CC dichotomy has been known for a very long time, but it's really only recently the scientists started to realize it's really because these different meteorites were created in completely different spots of the solar system. But this was just a hypothesis and it needed more proof. As a matter of fact, it needed a lot of proof. And so the recent paper goes in a lot more detail, pretty much establishing exactly what a lot of scientists believed for a very long time. 
there was a really large gap in the solar system and this gap created conditions necessary for very specific planets to form. On the one side of the gap we had the terrestrial planets, on the other side we had the gas giants and a lot of other objects, including dwarf planets. With the gap itself very likely existing for maybe a few million years, approximately 4.567 billion years ago. And because many similar gaps have been observed in a lot of other star systems, it totally makes sense. But what exactly formed it? Well, at the moment there are two possible scenarios, but even these are not really certain yet. The first scenario involves a massive planet, but probably not Saturn. As Jupiter grew in size and became bigger and bigger, it also started to push a lot of the gas, creating a larger and larger gap. And as it moved across the solar system, the gap sort of stayed behind, with Jupiter just ending up in a different location. On the other hand, this could also be because of the disk itself, maybe Jupiter had nothing to do with this. And so the second explanation involves the disk. In this case, as the disk itself starts to coalesce and becomes more powerful, it also starts emitting its own winds. And these winds form simply because of the relatively powerful magnetic fields that are normally present inside these disks. But these winds can be powerful enough to start emitting so much radiation that a lot of the mass starts to sort of disappear or moves to a different location. This can also lead to a production of relatively large gaps. So some of these gaps in this particular disk could have actually been created through these very powerful winds produced by the disk itself. And once the gap forms, it literally acts as a kind of a boundary. It's very difficult to go through this gap, and so whatever is on one side of the gap starts to accrete and form one type of an object. On the other side of the gap you'll have a completely other type of an object. Which in our solar system led to the formation of terrestrial planets and gas giants. And because it would be somewhat difficult for any planetary object to cross the gap, it would actually require a lot of energy and quite a lot of momentum to move from one region to the other, that's why we mostly have gas giants on one side and terrestrial planets on the other side. And in this case, even the moons of Jupiter and Saturn are very different in composition to our own moon. For the most part, all of these moons contain a lot of ices on the inside. Our moon, however, is mostly terrestrial. Which once again suggests that they were produced in very different locations of the solar system. But then we have this recent paper that you can find in the description below that has gone even a step farther. They were able to successfully show that the reason why these different meteorites exist is really because of this gap. And this gap definitely explains the origin of various types of planets. Essentially providing even more direct proof for the existence of something like this in the early solar system. The way that they prove this is by analyzing the magnetic fields of various asteroids. In this case, the team behind this paper analyzed the signs of different magnetic fields that were present when the meteorites were formed and essentially looked at various changes uh, created by the magnetic fields inside the tiny particles that were present inside meteorites. Here we're talking about particles that are usually known as chondrules. Chondrules are these tiny formations present in some of the meteorites, or actually in most of the meteorites, and generally various electrons inside these chondrules will actually be aligned with the magnetic field that was present in the early solar system. And so by directly measuring the alignment inside the chondrules of various meteorites, they were able to work out the approximate magnetic field that was present when these particular meteorites were formed. Specifically comparing the carbonaceous chondrite to the non-carbonaceous chondrite meteorites. So basically those meteorites that have this dichotomy. And to their surprise they discovered that the meteorites that were carbonaceous in nature and that were most likely made farther away from the sun, anywhere between 3 to maybe 7 astronomical units, seem to contain approximately double the magnetic field of some of the non-carbonaceous meteorites that were studied in previous studies that were also made much closer to the Sun, essentially where Earth, Mars and the Moon were created. But normally we expect the magnetic field to sort of decrease equally away from the Sun. We don't expect it to suddenly increase farther away from the Sun. And the increase here was quite dramatic. The magnetic field for the closer non-carbonaceous chondrites was approximately 50 microtesla. That's actually very similar to the magnetic field of planet Earth right now. But these distant carbonaceous chondrites had approximately double the magnetic field, about 100 microtesla. And to the scientists behind this paper, this implied, well, really two things. 
One is that there was a lot of accretion going on which created much more powerful magnetic fields, which is also the reason why we ended up getting a lot of massive planets like Jupiter and Saturn. And so in other words, this suggests that the outskirts of the solar system here had a really really large amount of accretion, which also created very powerful magnetic fields in comparison to the inner region. This also very likely produced extremely powerful winds, which then also probably produced the gap that we observe from various studies. Which of course altogether kind of makes sense and explains a lot of things about the solar system. It explains why we have two different types of asteroids, at least in terms of isotopic composition. It also explains why we have two major types of planets, terrestrial and gas giants. And it also explains why the magnetic field in the early solar system was slightly stronger on the outskirts compared to the inner part of the solar system where planets like Earth would develop early on. And so in this case, the outer region of the solar system was probably just experiencing a lot more accretion which created much more powerful magnetic fields. And this also means that something similar very likely happens in a lot of other star systems, which can also probably answer the question of how various types of planets form in other systems as well. For example, some of the planets that don't exist in the solar system, such as many Neptunes, super Earths, hot Jupiters and so on, these planets very likely were created differently in other star systems because of somewhat similar reasons. Probably because of the interaction of the early planetary disk and various gaps that existed in these star systems as well. But for now, this is just a discovery about our own solar system. It doesn't explain other star systems just yet. And so on that note, that's all I wanted to mention. Once we discover something else about either the solar system or about how other planets form, I'll make sure to follow this up with another video. Until then, thank you for watching, subscribe if you still haven't, share this with someone who loves learning about space and sciences, and maybe come back tomorrow to learn something else. Maybe support this channel on Patreon by joining the channel membership or by buying the wonderful person t-shirt you can find in the description. Stay wonderful, I'll see you tomorrow, and as always, bye-bye.